Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. It's Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have a returning guest, Alejandro Reyes Munoz. Uh, he's an assistant professor at the Department of Biological Sciences, uh, Universidad de los Andes. And we talked last time about um, bacteriophages and their interaction with uh, the microbiome. Um, also viruses, obviously, uh, you know, non-bacteriophages, but viruses that affect our own cells and us are a hot topic, unfortunately, right now with the coronavirus. So I wanted to uh, get his perspective on virus uh, cell interactions, all different kinds. That's why I have him back. We had a great call last time. So, Alejandro, welcome back. How are you doing? Hi, Richard. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like, I don't know, there's just not much, uh, there's not even much talk about virus to cell interactions or phage to bacteria interactions. So, I don't know, what, I know it's a big question, but in this area, have, have you focused more on like bacteria phage to bacteria interactions or have you looked also at virus to let's say human or other animal cell interactions? So in my research, I'm basically a computational biologist nowadays. So uh, we are very interested also in the phage host interaction. And in particular, because since we're looking at all the diversity of viral sequences that exist, uh, and we're looking at them in, in, in different environments, including the human gut, for example, but we also look for viruses in different environments. And you find so many different sequences that one of the main questions you have is what does this virus infect? What is the host of this virus? And then the question of uh, virus host interaction comes very, very relevant. And it's uh, a very complex question because there are different ways in which a virus and a host need to interact in order to get a successful infection. And all those checkpoints have to be uh, fulfilled so you can have a productive infection by the virus. And, and of course, there's always a, an arm race between the phage and the host, the host trying to protect, trying to change the receptors, trying to change the strategies, and the phage to adapt to be able to continue infect that productive host. And sometimes the phage can also switch host. And, and if they have the capability of infecting certain bacteria by a given receptor, and then th that bacteria is no longer having that receptor, but a neighboring ba bacteria may have it, then they will just switch host and begin infecting a new bacteria. So, so like our microbiome, I know it's pretty persistent and it's resistant to being disturbed, but I also know that there's viruses constantly that are preying upon, you know, the bacteria that constitute our microbiome. So what do you think that interaction looks like, you know, over a period of, I don't know, a month? Is the virus, uh, you know, let's say I have, uh, I don't know, a bifidobacteria that comprises, uh, I don't know, 20% of my, my gut microbiome. And it always seems to sit there at that 20%. What's happening is like the, the phage killing it and is the, the bacteria adapting and fighting off the phage. And there's just like this, you know, killing and multiplying um, balance so that the, uh, the bacteria just is kind of persistent there or like, what do you think happens? What do these interactions look like? So, so we have done some studies in that and something that is important to take into consideration is that the microbiome, e even if you just think about the bacterial part of it, describing all the other microorganisms that make part of the microbiome, just the bacteria, there are so many different bacteria that is like having like I don't know, like a city, like a whole population with very specialized bacteria doing very specialized functions in, in the environment. Even they're split spatially uh, throughout the gut and in different interaction with the, with the human host itself. So, so it's a very complex architecture of a community that is constantly changing based on the diet that we have. So depending on the nutrients you're bringing in, some bacteria that can work with those nutrients will start growing faster than other bacteria. And the bacteria that 
you no longer give the nutrient they like, they start growing slower, doesn't necessarily mean that they will disappear. They usually go into like rest and, and they'll just stay there. And then, of course, together with that comes the viruses. So a virus is, is a pathogen that depending on how long it has evolved with its host, the, the worst a pathogen can do is to kill fast the host. Because if you kill very fast, then you don't have any host any longer to, to grow yourself in. So a virus will try to keep the host and give benefits to the host for as long as possible. And many, many of the phages and something that we have seen in particular in the human gut is that there seem to be this particular type of phages that have the capacity of going inside the, the bacterium and remain silent, even, even integrating the DNA into the genome or just staying outside, but just stay there with the bacteria, just taking a ride with the bacteria. And if the bacteria is doing good, well, the virus is doing good. It's being protected and it's growing and it's multiplying along with the bacterial genome. And then when there's any stress, then the fish will pop up and they'll say, okay, this host is not longer working for me. I'm going to go out, make a lot of progeny and look for another host. Um, and then- So wait, so do, you, do you think um, <clears throat> predominantly the bacteria phages are, I guess, commensal, like they're, they're inside the bacteria in our gut, they're hanging out, they're not really bothering it. And then what, when that bacteria undergoes stress, do you think the phages all of a sudden say, all right, we're out of here. And they, they, they cause the bacteria to multiply more of the phage and blow them up and they move on to like better, uh, greener pastures. Exactly. That, that, and, and that's of what we have seen. Uh, so that's in terrible. general, we have the bacteria, which usually have the, the phage in it. Uh, and the fish is not doing much. However, something that is very interesting and is the, the beneficial part of the bacteria is that phages, since they move around, they can move also genetic material. So if the fish was in a, one bacteria and then they take a gene from that bacteria that is useful for the bacteria, then they are also providing themselves to be useful for that bacteria or for any other bacteria where they move. And that's the horizontal gene transfer aspect of it. So the phages may be moving genes around that are useful for the bacteria. And it's thought that it between anywhere between, I think, around 10 to probably 30% of the of a, of a phage genome is composed of genes that are not essential for the host, repli for the phage replication. So they should be bringing some, and, and are genes that you will usually find is encoded in bacterial genomes. So they should be bringing some benefit of the bacteria while the phage is in there, or they should provide benefit for the phage as they're coming out. Um, so Wait, so you, you, you're, you're, saying that, you're saying that, I know phages can endogenize inside of bacteria and viruses can endogenize inside of, inside of our DNA, but... You're saying that phages also will actively rearrange a bacteria's DNA while it's alive? Not rearrange it, but just bring more more coding capacity to it. So it's not that the phage okay. is manipulating the host genome and removing and putting in things. But while the phage genome is incorporated into the bacterial genome, now the bacteria can use also those genes if they need. Uh, so that will bring benefit, a temporal benefit to the bacterium. And then that is important because it brings a necessity of the bacteria to keep the phage. Because if the phage is bringing a new gene with new capabilities, now the bacteria is actually interested in keeping the phage inside. And, you think and it then, sound like, um, do, you, do you believe viruses are alive or at least contingently alive once they enter into a... It's a, it's a very tricky question. And, and then if you look at, and now we have these very huge viruses that have even more genes than, than a small bacteria may have. And we have seen those viruses infecting fungi, infecting amoeba, and, and those have huge genomes, almost even, as I was mentioning, even bigger than a small bacteria. And if you look at the replication cycle of some of those uh, intracellular parasitic bacteria, and you look at uh, the cycle of one of those viruses, it turned out to be quite similar. They have a lot of genes, they are producing progeny. The difference is uh, they multiply quite a bit and, and there's certain differences, but it's very hard to say right now where you consider something is alive or not. But definitely these are biological entities that are evolving, that are responding to environments and that have a set of 
genomic features that has allowed them to evolve and interact with their corresponding host. And it has brought benefits to both for the host and, and for the bacterium themselves. The other part that is important when you have a, when the bacteria has a phage inside, it's that it also gives protection because once you have a phage inside, similar phages cannot infect you. So if you have a couple of different phages inside yourself, then by the same way, you're making yourself immune to that population of phages in the environment. And that's an, also a big benefit for that bacterium. How, how are you making yourself immune by having certain phages to others? How does that happen? Uh, it does happen by, by different mechanisms. Sometimes, for example, the, the phage itself codes for an, a homologue of the receptor that it uses, but it's a, a non, uh, like a non-responsive receptor. So the phage will produce that receptor, will send it to the surface of the bacteria, and if another phage is coming, they will bind to that receptor, but that receptor doesn't work. So the phage will not be able to come in. Also, if it happens that the phage is able to attach and, and injects their DNA inside, some phages are capable of recognizing when that other phage DNA comes in and they will destroy that DNA before that phage can actually create a progeny or, a, or duplicate itself. That's crazy. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, do you... Viruses are cool. It seems like they're, I mean, I'm going to say living, but it seems like they're living libraries or they're tools that, it seems like viruses use cells as tools for their own ends, but cells also use viruses as tools for their own ends. Yeah, it's, 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 I, I kind of think it about like that. And, and it's not a, just any regular tool. It's a very highly optimized tool because it's a tool that can be moved. One bacteria can technically send, not necessarily intentionally, send a phage to another related bacteria. So it's like sharing that tool with the other bacteria. But then there's a tool that has to be small and, and different viruses have different genome sizes, but usually the genome size of a virus depends on, on a couple of things and, and the uh, mutation rate, because longer genomes, if they have a high mutation rate, they will not really work. And then also on the, on the size of the capsid, the, the size of that home outside of the bacterium that the, the, the phage has, uh, that it only can carry a certain amount. So if you know that you have a limited amount of space that you can take with you once you move out of your house, you can only take exactly what you need, exactly the things that are important. And that's why the viruses are so interesting because they can change, they can mutate, they can, they can adapt really fast. But the final product that you find in the capsid contains only the really things that they need in order to be able to create a new infection or, or, or some other strategy. And that's why it's so interesting to study those genomes because they have, because they can mutate so much, they have tried many, many different variations and many different mutations. But at the end of the day, they only keep the one that really, really work. So I think that's why understanding what the genomes of those viruses code for uh, is really important for biology in general, not just for understanding yeah. the dynamics between bacteria and viruses. How, and, how, do we, uh, how do we determine, by the way, based on a, a virus's RNA or DNA, what it could code for? How do we know that? Uh, regular uh, computational biology tools. So essentially you, you'll sequence the genome. Now there's many ways using next generation sequencers. You make the libraries, you sequence the genome, you assemble the genome, and then you have to start doing the gene calling, which in viruses is also a little bit tricky. Not all viruses have exactly the same genome architecture or the same type of genes to be called. But there are some ways into which you can identify different genes that a virus contains. But being able to identify where a gene starts and where it ends or the sequence of amino acids that the gene will have doesn't necessarily tell you what those proteins are doing. And there is where is the big trick because nowadays we can do the gene calling relatively straightforward. We can identify the genes that the virus are coding, but in average, 70%, 70% of those genes, we just have no idea what they're doing because they have no similarity to anything we have. So, is there, um, is there a master library of every RNA or DNA sequence that has ever been 
I mean, would this be useful? Like, what if there was a master library of every DNA or RNA sequence ever obtained from any creature, bacteria, virus, person, animal, whatever, um, and things were compared against that library to see where there's matching? Is that how we can tell, for instance, that, you know, we have endogenized uh, viruses in our genome? Like, how do we know that? Exactly. So we do have such libraries. And those are the genomic databases. So there are there is an international standard genomic database consortium between the National Center for Biotechnology Information, the NCBI in the US, the European Bioinformatic Institute in Europe, and the DNA database of Japan. So it's in different parts of the world. And they have uh, the largest repository, shared repository of publicly available sequences. And the idea is essentially that to contain this, the data for everything that has been sequenced uh, in the world. Uh, but yeah, so they are talking about nowadays, they should be talking about 20 petabytes or more of data that is deposited in those databases. So as we generate more and more data, it gets more challenging to be able to analyze all that data. Uh, and that's the, the challenge of developing new computational tools to be able to efficiently query those databases to see if what I'm generating looks like anything that has been generated before. And what is interesting is that when we sequence the viruses, they just don't look like anything that has been generated before or nothing that we have been able to isolate in laboratories. So they so viruses, DNA and RNA, they constitute like a vast unexplored library of ability of things that can be coded for of different features and functions and, and things like that. I guess it's like a, you know, like a library that's everywhere all around us that is accessible by some and, you know, forced exactly. upon others. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the, the magic of it. It, it. Biologically, it's all around us and inside us. And, and then some of us have the capacity of isolating them and sequence them. And not very many have the capacity of understanding what they're doing. And I must say, it's, it's a very active field of research. And, and we're trying to precisely develop methods in order to understand, not only to decode it, because it's, it's relatively easy to, to extract the nucleic acid, DNA, or RNA, and, and sequence it, but actually to make a meaning out of that. That's incredible. So I, I recently spoke to a company that has uh, about 1,700 sequences of this new coronavirus. And they told me that um, about 900 of them were unique or different, you know, maybe even in small ways. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> they had thought that these are all random mutations. I, I would think just, you know, it's my own personal feel that they're actually deliberate adaptations. But if you look at that, if you consider something like that, like where is the coronavirus headed in terms of, like, where does it want to go? Does it, do you think it wants to become just a permanent part of us? Do you think it just wants to, kill as many of us as possible? Do you think that it wants to endogenize into our DNA? Like what, do you think it has a goal and where is it headed? Anyway. <laughs> okay, that, that's a interesting question in, in, in different ways. Uh, I, I truly believe that the coronavirus is a naturally occurring virus. It's, it's part of a large family of viruses that we have known for many, many decades. And we know that they just infect humans, usually giving them a, a simple cold. This one, by still unknown reasons, seemed to be able to recruit more of the immune cells and generate a very strong response, causing uh, the, the, the most serious cases that we have seen, unfortunately. Um, and, and as I was mentioning, so the, this virus is not a retrovirus. We know about that. So retrovirus are, the, are those viruses that are, have their genetic material being RNA. And then they have an intermediate step of DNA that can get endogenized into your genomes. That's not the case of the coronavirus. This is an RNA virus, so it will not be incorporated into our genes, or it will not be able to take any part of our genome with, with it. Uh, and, but however, since it's an RNA virus, so RNA has the tendency to mutate much more than DNA. Uh, but something that I was uh, partially telling you before is that there's a relationship between the genome size and the mutation rate. So the longer you have your genome, the less that you can mutate it because it will make your variant stable. And if we 
Let's start from the point that most mutations are going to be deleterious because you have optimized your tool so much that if you make random changes, most of your changes are going to create a worse tool than it was before. Only very few changes may create a tool that was better than the previous version. So in that sense, if you have a very large genome and you change it a lot, usually you will be incorporating several mutations that will make the virus incapable of generating more infection. So that's why this virus, for being an RNA virus, is relatively large. It has like a 29,000 genome, uh, 29,000 nucleotide genome. Uh, and that's why this virus doesn't mutate as much as like the influenza viruses may do as like the Zika or chikungunya viruses. Those are viruses that mutate much more. So this virus has been relatively stable. And up to now, uh, most of the sequences that have been coming out just show essentially random changes because they don't seem to be bringing any adaptive capacity or we haven't seen the mutation rate increasing in any way. Um, so as of now, we are not really aware that there is any kind of directed evolution by the virus to become more pathogenic or more resistant. And it's just that... What if, what that, if we were able to match clinical outcomes with the different sequences? Maybe then we would see where is it, where is it going? Anywhere, nowhere, random? I agree. And, and we still don't have enough data for that, I think. Um, and, and in part is that, as you know, with this virus, many of the patients are non-symptomatic. And since they're non-symptomatic, uh, they haven't really been tested or sampled. So probably we don't have enough data from non-symptomatic patients uh, to see how the virus's genomes look like to be able to compare it to the probably what comes to be most of the cases of the genomes that we have that are likely they're the most of your cases. Oh, so we'd preferentially see just the vari we'd preferentially see the variations that are either just as pathogenic or virulent or the mo the worst ones, I guess, you know, for our health. We wouldn't yeah. see the ones that uh, don't affect us that much. And and right, and, and usually each genome will just have out of those twenty eight thousand nucleotides, it will just have a handful of of variations at most. And, and some of those will be completely random. Some of those will seem to, to stay. And then you will see that as you sequence more and more, so you begin, and that's how they call like the clusters of viruses. And they know like almost all the patients in Spain were coming from a given cluster or, have, or a few sequences coming out from China. And that's how they are able to trace back because there are some characteristic mutations that the virus in China had that essentially most of the isolates from Spain have. And, and for example, so I was looking at some of the data from Latin America and some sequences from Chile and one that came out from Colombia looked very much like imported cases from Spain because they really clustered because they have a couple of those characteristic mutations. However, based on those mutations, we haven't seen that they may change the protein itself in a way that you will believe that is making it the protein more efficient or more virulent than the uh, ancestral state. It could but, be more virulent or less, or it could you know, change the surface receptors on the capsid so that they affect different kinds of cells. Maybe that's why there's some intestinal problems and other ones are lung and other ones are heart. Or maybe, I mean, maybe there's ones that make it better to hide from the immune system, or I guess there's a lot of different variation that could happen, right? Exactly, and, and that's all the arm race dynamics that the viruses have with their host. The host will try to protect itself, the virus will try to change and mutate to adapt and to be able to remain with its host. Um, not necessarily the virus, although RNA viruses in general tend to be more virulent. If you see the viruses that I have mentioned that are RNA like HIV, uh, the same Zika, chikungunya, and flu, they tend to be acute viruses, acute diseases, uh, and, and sometimes will be more or less pathogenic. Uh, because they, they nature as RNA viruses, they make them not to, to stay for too long within the host uh, before this, the host can bring a, a response. But they, they, 
I think in general, viruses, as, as I was mentioning at the beginning, they, they gain nothing in being very pathogenic and, and killing its host. It's, it's not a benefit for the virus. The biggest benefit of the virus is like the flu, that it doesn't create a very strong disease. And that means that the virus is just circulating with us for years and years and years. The virus changes. That's why we need a different flu vaccine every year because it has changed and adapted, but it's just the, the same virus just moving on with the population. Do you think uh, either deliberately or randomly uh, the coronavirus is headed over the next, and again, over how long? Over the next few months, over the next year? Like, where do you think it may go and how will it uh, change? That's a, a hard question in particular, since that is not necessarily my, my field of expertise. Um, but precisely because of what we know of other coronaviruses, that they just circulate as common cold within an, uh, the human population. And the same thing happened with the flu. So yeah, we have the swine flu and then we have the bird flu, which are specific recombinations, but then eventually they begin to be common and recurrent within the population. So I'm sure that these viruses or, or a slight modification of this coronavirus may remain with uh, the human population for a long time. It will be just that we will gain, a lot of us will gain immunity um, because we, we got the virus and survived it, or hopefully there will be some vaccines or treatments. And hopefully, and then essentially what everybody's talking about, uh, flattening the curve, what we hope is that right now, nobody knew the virus, nobody has been hit by the virus, and it's taking everybody at the same time. Hopefully in the future, it will be just few people and not a big chain of people being uh, infected by the virus. And that will make the cases not as severe, probably will not create the rates of mortality that we're seeing and, and the saturation of the healthcare systems in, in a lot of the countries as we're seeing. That it's just going to be another uh, virus that's here with us and it's going to be here with us for good. Or not for good, but for the foreseeable future. Yeah, it's quite likely until something happens that it makes the virus less efficient or begins to get removed from the population, maybe replaced by some other virus. Um, it will happen as well. In particular, are you uh, are you studying, you know, right now? You said you're in, in, into bioinformatics. What are you trying to figure out right now? What are you working on? Uh, my main interest uh, right now, I have, different projects. A lot of those are doing more microbiomes and microbiomes associated with different bacterial communities and environment. And in the viral side, I'm very interested in what was precisely mentioning about being able to develop computational methods to identify what some of those genes uh, that viruses contain, in particular the phages, may be coding for. What are they bringing? What can they be doing? And since I'm very interested in characterizing viruses from different environments, I'm also very interested in developing computational methods to identify that phage host uh, interaction and being able to say, okay, this, is a, this seems to be a new virus that I was able to find it in fresh water. Uh, which of the different bacteria from that fresh water could be the host? So trying to give insights into that is what we're currently working the most. Um. <clears throat> What's uh? What are your thoughts on um? Again, back to the coronavirus a bit. Do you think that um there will be vaccines for it? Do you think that there'll be more antivirals for it? You know, knowing I guess about previous you know corona type viruses, uh, what seems to work? Or is it a combination of both? Yeah, I think there'll be both of them, and I I know there are already several initiatives, both for vaccines and potential drugs and treatments that are moving on different trials. Um, I think what is fascinating of this circumstance, even though with all the hardship that it has bring, is how it has helped scientists come together, open science, uh, releasing results really fast. As soon as scientists begin getting genome sequence or any sort of data that could be helpful, they are uh, releasing all that data. And, and this is making processes that usually will take years, like developing a new vaccine, to seem likely that could happen within six to eight months or maybe even a little less. So there are uh, a few trials already working for a potential vaccine, but 
there are many different aspects that have to be checked, uh, safety issues, side effects, et cetera, et cetera, that have to be checked of a vaccine before it can be released to the public. And the same thing with the treatment. So um, the low hanging fruit is just see what other uh, treatments have been useful for the other coronavirus and see if those will work with this one. And then as we get data, for example, modeling the precisely the spike protein that is the one that it binds to the human receptor, try to see if there are other known uh, pharmaceuticals that have the capability of binding to that protein and potentially inactivating the virus or preventing the virus from joining its target cell. So a lot of those is already under research and the very scientists are working like 24 seven to be able to understand more of the nature and the dynamics of the virus. You said you've been able to look at data for the virus in you know, Latin America and Spain and other places. Where, I mean, I don't know if the normal person, the lay person could even interpret what they see, but where is that data being uh, shared from? Yes, there's a few websites. As I was mentioning, the public database repositories, NCBI, EBI, DDBJ, those are holding special sections for the position of sequences from the coronavirus, and they have already even specialized tools to compare your sequence with other coronavirus. So you can go there, and those are publicly available. There are other places where people are depositing their the data as well. So uh, I may misspell it, but I think it's G-I-S-A-I-D is one of those big places that has also an attached tool that is called NextTrain. So if people Google like NextTrain coronavirus, it will give you a website that will allow you to see like a phylogenetic tree of the viruses. And, and you can even highlight and a phylogenetic tree of all the sequenced genomes, a map of the world uh, tracking all those genomes where they have come from, and even a little inset of the genome, and you can see individual mutations uh, where in that in all those sequences have been found or not. So you will see what are the, the mutations as I was telling you that are specific for giving clades or subset of the viruses. And that's why we know or we're capable more or less of tracing where some of those isolates have come from. And then uh, I just want to ask you one more question going back to like the very beginning. Again, when, it, when we consider, let's say, our, um, our microbiome and we think about a particular bacteria that's, that's present there and persistent, what is its relationship with its phage or phages? Is it the phage is continually adapting and the bacteria is continually adapting and you know, over a long period of time, are they both very far along in terms of change and adaptation? Or what do you think, the, again, the, the long-term dynamic is of you know, those pairings? I think the whole thing about phage and bacteria is keeping them active, keeping them moving, keeping everybody evolving, keeping them adapting to new conditions, gaining new capacities and new fitness. Because if you stay in your place, you'll find a virus that will be able to to take you and kill you. So, so all the bacteria has to be constantly adapting. And it goes back what, to what I was mentioning at the beginning of a complex community. So if, uh, I don't know, if a virus, as you were mentioning, uh, hits bifidobacterium and kills the bifidobacterium, a given uh, viruses and phages are usually very, very specific, even almost a strain specific or a species specific. So if they're hitting a given species of bifidobacterium, it likely is not going to be replaced by a very different bacteria just because the bifidobacterium has a very specific task and a very specific role within the microbiome community. So likely the one that was going to take the place of that is another bifidobacterium. And, and which is likely the other bifidobacterium that will take place is one that is already resistant to that virus, maybe one that is already harboring a virus. So that is a competitive advantage of the bacteria when they have already viruses inside them because the susceptible ones will die and now they can take their place in that microbial community. Um, and usually that's what you see. So you, overall, you don't see big changes. You don't see that a virus came in and completely changes the complete structure of the community. Instead, you just see that maybe one strain of a specific bacteria goes out and another strain of that same type of bacteria will come now to replace it. 
and that's usually what you see and that's the type of dynamics so it's very specific very uh specific changes in the community and that's also why the the face therapy that is being kind of coming back recently seems to be so interesting because with antibiotics you sometimes hit all the bacteria or a, a large subset of bacteria good and bad bacteria but at the same while with phages you can target specifically the pathogen and make sure that you just remove the pathogen without hurting any other part of the community. And that's one big advantage of that because now we know the value of the microbiome and how you, important it is to keep a balance in healthy microbiome. Um, so do you think that uh, a particular bacteria after it's under attack for a while by a phage, I mean, just falls in, in prevalence and declines and another one takes its place? Or do you think there is a persistence of a particular strain of bacteria and a particular type of phage that just are in this this battle where no one wins you know the bacteria are always dividing and making more and the phage is is killing them but you know neither side can can do enough to get rid of the other yeah i think it's a combination of both i think uh sometimes you have a host a bacterium that probably is going under a lot of stress for like nutrient availability or some other competition that if they happen to see find a, sorry, a virus that infects them, they may be wiped out of that community with ha without having a chance of fighting. But usually when you have a, it's a largely abundant member of that community and then it gets hit by the phage, yeah, the abundance of that bacteria will go down, probably somebody else will take over. But usually if you have just a tiny bit of that bacterium left that was able to mutate and change and adapt. And if that bacteria was really that important for that community, performing a function that nobody else will be able to do, then that bacteria will recover back to its original um, abundance. And then it, it will likely be also some fish left somewhere that has changed and maybe it changed to begin infecting another host or maybe it has changed to be able to now infect the newly resistant bacteria and will come back again. So, so it's a lot of variables that are in play there. But uh, yeah, usually if you have a, a highly resilient community and you have a high abundance bacteria, those are likely to become resistant and come back again. And they will just be, and that's why I was mentioning about this dynamic to be, keep just everybody active. You just have to keep changing, keep adapting, keep bringing like the best of yourself to, to be able to persist in the community. Well, very good. Well, Alejandro, I appreciate you coming back again. Um, I'm always amazed by the things you tell me. It's just, it's incredible. <laughs> so what's, What's the best way people can keep up with uh, with your work and what you're doing? How can they uh, find out more? Uh, essentially, they can look at uh, the website of the lab. Uh, Uniandes is bcem.uniandes.edu.co for Colombia. Uh, we try to post some things there. And... Uh, and just in the, within the scientific community, following some of the papers that we're getting out, but we try to put, put most of the information in the website. We're working on, on trying to keep it up to date. Okay, very good. Well, again, thank you for coming back and I appreciate it. Thank you, Richard. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.